and welcome to this video. This is a very serious video. Because I'm actually going to do it. I'm actually going to do it today. I'm going to rank the albums by Pink Floyd. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rank them from 15 being the worst to number one, which is the best. And I'm going to go through and say why I think they should be placed there. It is only my opinion. I know the Pink Floyd the fans out there are rabid, insane psychos, and they are going to criticise any criticism I have of the band. I know that before I start. But the thing is, is I've got a channel where I look at progressive rock and classic rock and improvised music, and Pink Floyd, the, the biggest band in the world to ever explore this type of music. So I have to deal with it. I haven't before, because actually, not being a huge fan of Pink Floyd, which I'm not, half of these albums I never really listened to that much right i have spent the last week going and listening through them and then i went back and i can't compare them and i tried to get a shape of this band with all the albums it's been very educational in some ways my opinion is improved of pink floyd but in other ways i do think on the whole this is an overrated band that have made some of the greatest albums in music history that are equal to many other great albums but there is a lot of stuff that's not that great here in my opinion, but you've got to understand my tastes, right? This is not my thing, you know. I don't like middle of the road rock, so that knocks a whole bunch of them. I'm a jazzer, so when people are improvisers and they can't play very well, it's a bit dodgy. I'm not a fan of that. I like virtuosity, they don't do that so much. Um, I love quirky Englishness, so I love the Sid Barrett stuff. And the fact that Sid Barrett just then disappears spoils it for me. Now, I've got a list here. It's not in order. I've really done... The, the, the ranking I've got is so complex because I've got a lot of cross-referencing. So I might get a bit stuck. But it starts at 15. Um, I haven't included any of the live albums um, except for Omegoma, which has a, a live disc on. I put that one in and there will be special mention to um, Pink Floyd Live at Pompeii, which has come out as a, an album at some point. So I will mention that, but I'm not going to count that one, but I will talk about it in this list. Um, there's some brilliant albums on here, some of the greatest albums ever made, uh, and there's some not so brilliant, right? And if I'm criticising Pink Floyd, it's not because I think they're a bad band. What it is is I, I am basically saying that this is a great band, this is an influential band, it's an important band. But the, the place that they are held in, in, in the minds of people, which is equal to, say, like the Beatles or Led Zeppelin, I don't believe that this catalogue warrants that. I think people are really saying that on based upon one of three albums, really, maybe four. The rest of it is, is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> to my ears but you're, if, if, if you're going to get upset with this just give us a chance to say and then go there Andy's that's Andy's opinion I can see where you're getting he likes Billy Comedy as a Mavish Dog it's, it's not his thing you know but I do love him I do love him I'm, I'm you know any, <laughs> oh god alright you know I ain't going to even read the comments so there's no point in putting anything because I ain't going to really answer it I bet I do in the end I won't be able to resist it because some idiot will come up and say you know you don't know nothing about it you're a terrible man you shouldn't be saying this I've done all this on another video I won't do that again I enjoyed it the first time I'm not going to enjoy it the same time so at number 15 on my list the lowest the worst album by Pink Floyd is there was a toss up between which one it should be I decided to go for Omegoma and the reason I went for Omegoma because it's just a rubbish album I don't think anybody wants to listen to it now it's redeemed by the first diff disc which is a live versions of the stuff on the albums before and those versions in many cases are better than the originals I think because Pink Floyd at that point were a sort of live psychedelic band and it was an experience. People would go and see them. They'd drop acid. They'd sit there. They'd go, whoa, whoa, it's all electronic and weird. They wouldn't know what the hell was going on. And they could do whatever they liked. As long as they sort of got into some sort of minor second riff. You know, Nick Mason gets the old, you know, beaters out. And does the sort of, those, those sort of tom-tom beats. It's, it's, it's all very 60s and it, it beat Nicky, isn't it? The Pink Floyd are at that point. And I enjoy that. That's great, you know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, that live stuff's okay. It's good. It's nowhere near as good as the versions that we hear on uh, Pink Floyd at Pompeii, which is one of the greatest albums ever made, in my opinion. And it's not on this list, right? Uh, but the rest of it, the self-indulgent rubbish of a band that's got no direction at this point and does not know what they're doing, right? Probably arguing with each other. You see, because the thing with Pink Floyd, you've got to understand, is Pink Floyd got signed because of Sid Barrett. There was a band there 
with with the it, there's the art student and the three architecture students they're all nice young middle class english gentlemen you know they probably enjoy a scotch egg you know with a pint you know they they they're destined to smoke a pipe and go for a walk in the countryside with a with a little dog and prod in hedgerows with walking sticks that's what they are they're that type of person and we love them we love them they they, they are the they, they're the bedrock of progressive rock you know if they weren't in their sheds inventing the dyson vacuum cleaner they're going to be creating progressive rock and pink floyd are the first of the english gentlemen the posh english gentlemen but sid barrett's something else now sid barrett's dad he was like a famous like um medical person if i can remember rightly who who um was was an expert in 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 postmortems and cadavers or something like this really things and he's on wikipedia so this these are privileged people but sid barrett's the guy He's got the songs, he's got the vision, he's a good guitarist and an interesting guitarist, not just a cod blues guitarist, sounds like Peter Green. Interesting guitarist with his own sound and he's got charisma. He's a beautiful looking guy. He is an, a, a great singer, he's the whole package. That's why they got the deal. Once he goes off his head and he's gone, the thing that salvages Pink Floyd, this is what came across, is that we have three architecture students and they know how to do things. They, know they, they might have long hair and look like hippies, but they know how to organise stuff, right? And they organise Pink Floyd, despite the fact that they've got no real songwriter, right? No real instrumental ability. Um, no, I mean, Richard Wright's the best musician in there. He really is, but he is no Keith Emerson, all right? Um, and they have to try and reconfine. And, and these early albums are just... Even though they've gone down as classics, you listen to them, they don't know what they're doing. They're trying all the, like, let's just fill a side up with the avant-garde noise because, yeah, and then let's write sort of a, a, a strange jazz, cocktail jazz thing. Well, let's have, let's have a go at sort of a heavy rock track. You know, there's some Brian bands that sound like that. We're not very good at it, you know. Who's gonna sing, I don't know. Richard, can you sing on the second album? So this, I've, I've introduced what I think is going on with Pink Floyd in this early period. And um, Obama, which is their fourth album, came out in 1969. Think what's going on in 1969. By 1969, you know, Hot Rats, Bitches Brew, um, Band of Gypsies, Jimi Hendrix. This is what's going on in rock music at that time. Led Zeppelin won uh, Black Sabbath's first album. And they bring this out. You know, some okay, you know, recordings of a live album. And there's self-indulgent nonsense over a whole side because they haven't got an idea. Right, it, it, you know, people will sit there. This is the Emperor's Clothes. I listen to avant-garde music. It's not Stockhausen, right? It's not John Coltrane. It's not, it's just not. This is people that uh, are in the right place at the right time and they've got an audience, you know, and they've got some projections going along and everyone's just tripping out, you know, and it's like um, you could stick a fire alarm on stage and some fireworks and they're so blitz that they would find that fascinating. Sounds like a party I went to in the 1990s. So anyway, um, Omagoma, oh the worst. At number 14, um, right at the other end of the, the, the sort of travel we're about to describe with uh, uh, Pink Floyd is uh, the final cut. So the final cut came out in 1983, right? Um, four years after one of the biggest albums ever made, The Wall, right? Why did it take so long? Because The Wall destroyed the band. This thing that got them through, which was Roger Waters' organisational middle-class ability to be able to get a product and sell it, you know. Because if they had floundered, if they hadn't made Dark Side of the Moon, I promise you, we would be walking past arch architectural monstrosities that were created by the members of Pink Floyd in various town centres across the country. And as we walked past them, we would be aware that they would still be sat in their big country houses with all their money. They're destined to go that way. And they were, they were not going to let this project go. And Roger Waters, he's the pushy one, right? Richard, White's, Richard White, Wright is the musician. And Nick Mason, I think, was, was sort of... the Like, all, all good bands have to have a great drummer. Nick Mason isn't a brilliant drummer, but I love his drumming. That light, delicate sound of his, that sort of quite muffly sound... And, and it's just cool. And, 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 and it's the perfect drum beat to just drop mad stupid electronica over the top. You know, weird blips of the sounds. He can do that. So, that, so that, that's what the magic is once Sid Barrett's gone. And the, the main magic is Roger Waters coming in and learning how to write songs and impinging on it his worldview. 
By the time it gets to the wall, it's too overblown. I don't think the wall's that great an album. And it destroys the band who are now infighting and everyone's going, you know, and Richard Wright's gone. And basically we have the final cut, which is like, almost like a solo um, project for Roger Waters. It's dull, it's overblown, it's like really political and who bloody cares, you know. And uh, it's just a boring album. And, we, and it sees the end of Pink Floyd. And at that point, they should have not put the album out, but it went to number one, right? I've got the chart positions here. Um, so if you take Dark Side of the Moon, probably their greatest album, the, that went in the UK to number two, and in the US it went to number one. But the final cut went to number one in the UK. Oh, it went, only went to number six in the US. And see, it's because it's rubbish. Right, anyway, so that's what i got at number 15. So we've got two really appalling albums here. Right, let's move on. So what's the next one? We've got, um, we've done 15, 14. Sorry, I've got, I've got a weird system with all cross riffing and notes. Because I really wanted to make sure I've got this. At 13, I have The Endless River, right? Which is the album that they cobbled together out of bits that they found in the shed uh, with Richard Wright on after he died. I actually quite liked this album when I put it on. And this is where I can tell you I'm being objective. I haven't ranked it higher than Momentary Lapse of Reason or The Division Bell. But in terms of my enjoyment, I enjoyed it more. This, album's, this album is meandering. It's got not much of a state from, from a band of this size. But it's better produced. It sounds nicer than Momentary Lapse of Reason. And the Momentary Lapse of Reason and Division Bell, they're almost like Dave Gilmore's solo albums, especially Momentary Lapse of Reason. But the Endless River's not. The band's suddenly back. You know, I can hear the band. You can hear the little magic of this band, which is there. It might be, like, meandering. It might have no real point to it. It might be a very weak ending to this great band. But I, I, I put that on, and unlike Momentary Lapse of Reason, that was just getting on my nerves, th this I found quite nice to listen to in a sort of background music type of way. Uh, but... I'm being objective. It's a bit of a failure as an album. It's a cobbled together. No one's going to say this is a great album. This is a, this is a goodbye to Richard Wright. It's a goodbye to the fans. It's a nice thing. I like the cover. The cover's very nice. Uh, so that's what I've got at, um, at number 13. It's Endless Rhythm from 2014, their last album. So number 12 on my list is Obscured by Clouds. Now, Obscured by Clouds was actually one of the many um, soundtracks that they made. Um, the others being Zabriskie Point, which I haven't ranked, and more, which I have ranked. Um, Obscured by Clouds um, is it's, it's, it's an interesting soundtrack. Uh, there are some songs. There's half of it is songs, half of it is soundtrack stuff. Um, it's, it's very down. Right, This is the album that they made before Dark Side of the Moon. It's, it's Obscured by Clouds. Whoever even mentions it. Right, Think about it. It's, no one, it, it's just... It's just a non-event. They, they, are, they are starting to be able to write songs, right? I've got some notes on. Um, I put the, the gold it's in the, that track, I said, um, proves that they can rock, albeit in a cheesy way. There's more acoustic ballads on here. Um, it's the first introduction of a VC3 synthesizer, and suddenly we start to hear that Pink Floyd sound. That's quite important on here. Um, and I've put um, Free 4. There's a track called Free 4. What is the point of that track? And I've written, does anyone actually like these tunes? This is just an average album. And that's what it is. An average album from a great band. We've got it at number 12. At number 11, we've got Momentary Lapse in Reason. Right? Once uh, Roger Waters had, had left the band, um, uh, Gilmore takes control and we basically have a, a, a solo Gilmore album of course you've got his beautiful guitar solos on but that's all they are now you know they are basically a band like Dire Straits if you like Dire Straits then well maybe that's why you like it but for me this is all a bit lame it's all a bit sort of um, uh, yuppie rock is the only way I could describe it um, and I think at this point, because they're the biggest band in the world, they bring this album out and then they go live and they bring out Pulse and all these other live albums and the live versions, because we actually hear a band, albeit augmented by, you know, decent players. Um, the, the live albums, the live versions, I think, are better 
than the uh, the versions on Momentary Lapse of Reason. It's an okay album. So you can see, I, I'm, I'm getting quite deep into this and not c coming across great albums and definitely not no masterpieces. I'll tell you when we get to a great album. We haven't got there yet with Momentary Lapse of Reason. Um, uh, oh, sorry. And then the next, I've got these, I've got these tied together. Division Bell, I've got at number 10. Very close. Very similar. The Division Bell's just got the edge on it. You feel that the band's crept back a little bit. You feel that Richard Wright and uh, Nick Mason are a little bit more involved. The production's not as 80s. Um, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a good album. Uh, it's not my thing at all. It's just, it's just, it's just too um, middle of the road. I don't know what to say. It's not the sort of stuff I would talk about on here. I ain't going to do like Rake the Lighthouse Family or Simply Red. I'm not going to do that here. That's what this sounds like to me. Right, so what we were with number 10, so we're at number 9. So number 9, we've got Saucer Full of Secrets, the second album. Sid Barrett's left. He contributes to one track on this album, which is Jug Band Blues. And that's like the, that's okay. It's nothing like as the Sid Barrett at his best, you know. Um, they brought Dave Gilmore in. They don't know who's singing the songs. They don't know who the songwriter is. I just think it's really lame. It's right, they just haven't, don't know what they're doing on this album. Um, Set Controls of the Heart of the Sun, great track. Much better versions of it live later on, but that's a great track, and that's about the only track I liked on there. I'm sure Pink Floyd are going to be shouting at me, but me coming from the outside and listening to this album, I don't want to listen to this album. It's just, you know, 1968, there's people doing incredible stuff at this point. They are floundering. Right, at number eight, I have the follow-up to that, which is More. Um, More is an improvement overall in terms of the sound. Their songwriting's getting together, but it just lacks a classic tune. Um, some of it's rambling thinner, filler, that because it was made for a, a film, wasn't it? It was made for some weird... I actually watched the film as part of this, and I had to give up halfway through. Some 60s nonsense about people going to parties and getting stoned and... Uh, it's, uh, um, the thing about um, this album, right? I wouldn't say these classic tunes, but there's some acoustic tunes which I love. The, the, the Crying Game, I really do like. That's a good song. Cymbeline is another. They, these ethereal acoustic classics. They could have gone into this area um, and, and I quite like it. Again, it's almost like an artistic dead end. So we're not going to say, oh, Pink Floyd, they're brilliant. Right, well, which track do you want to listen to? Oh, listen to The Crying Game off more. It's, a, it's just them at their best. We're never going to do that. But these are nice songs. But you can tell they're just directionless. I don't know where they're going. they got their posh mates probably making posh art films. And it's keeping them going because they're getting commissioned to make these soundtracks. Right, and then they're more always followed up by Il Gummer. When they go back to try and make an album, it's just rubbish. They are. This is not good stuff, sorry. So uh, I got that at number eight. At number seven, I have The Wall. Now, The Wall, I would say, this is where we now get to great albums. From now on, we are dealing with great albums. But The Wall is flawed. Roger Waters has taken over. He wants to turn um, Pink Floyd from this incredible band where, like Dark Side of the Moon, that his vision is balanced with the sound of the band and they're all working together. The wall for me isn't quite there. You can feel the band's busting apart. And um, Roger Waters' commitment to try and maintain the narrative drives this album into sort of long stretches of just really dull boredom as he tries to not even tell the story, but just hammer home, home this sort of fascistic plot you know, and um, as I've said, this the, the the genius bits on these albums that, you know, after, once they find their creative spark with Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here, uh, this album, it's like the spirit and artistic um, might of Sid Barrett is sort of in, it's, it's that. It's almost like Roger Waters' reaction to that, which makes these albums have that little bit of a thing. This is an iconic album. The Wall's an iconic album, without a doubt. But um, for me, it's a flawed album. I'm not, I'm not a fan of it at all. I've tried to listen to it. I mean, personally, it's just a bit dull and dreary. You know, Comfortably Numb is, is not Wish You Were Here, and it's not The Great Gig in the Sky. It's just not for me. It's like a sort of strummy, acoustic song. It's, it builds... 
I don't know. It's uh, they they've taken on the sort of the lessons of punk and new wave. They they've pulled themselves in. They made this huge selling album. It's iconic. We all can remember them going out live and building the wall up. It's it's a good album. It's a it's a flawed. It's it's a, it's a flawed great album, right? Um, so we're into the era of flawed great albums here with the wall at number seven. I hope I don't miss something out. I'll, I'll check it at the end. At number six, I have Atom Heart Mother. Now, this is one of my favourite Pink Floyd's albums. The sidelong opener, Atom Heart Mother, which was recorded in 1970, is one of the first sidelong epics by prog bands. Um, ELP uh, have done Tarkus, but I think they're, they're second to this. This could well be um, the, 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 the first orchestrated sidelong prog track and we've got to give them the juice of that and it's brilliant they've got an orchestra there it's avant-garde but this the avant-gardeness on this is interesting this is a really great track i think it's the, i think it's a masterpiece at Heart mother mother it's difficult it's a difficult listen but it's different to omegoma where the avant-garde stuff is rubbish this is far more interesting it goes through far more different textures and it's a really successful marriage between sort of the orchestral bits and the the rock band bits the electronica bits so um i i really like atom heart mother um you uh you stick it over right onto side two um you've got if which is another rock roger waters acoustic gentle song there's a lot of those on here Summer of 68, which is like 1960s music, I just don't get it, you know. Fat Old Son, sounds a bit like Blur. There's a certain sound to Pink Floyd at this era, and I can hear echoes of Blur. But of course, Blur did manage to do one great album after the next and not, not go down the wrong thing. I would say Blur, on the whole, in terms of consistency, are a better band than Pink Floyd. Sorry, I would. Any, anyway, um, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast, just so I can show you where I'm coming from. Um, this is avant-garde, but it is strange English whimsy, and I love it. And that's the difference, right? Um, that's a great... So I think Atom Heart Mother is, is a great album with some cruddy tracks on, but on the whole, this is a great album, Atom Heart Mother. Um, so I, I think um, if we're looking at this catalogue, everything's going to be great from now on. We've got 15 albums, right? Well over half is not great to me. It's six albums that are really great, and we're now covering them now. Um, at number five, I have the first album, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. If this had been well recorded, right, because I find the production of their early albums really tinny. Uh, you know, they're dealing, they're trying to do too much on um, a four track, and I think they're having to lay the whole actual band jamming, the whole basic track onto one channel and it's it's i mean the beatles pulled it off they're in the same studio you know when they're doing this album piper at the gates of dawn next door they're, they're they're you know when they're having a cup of tea they're watching the beatles making sergeant pepper this is incredible um it's sid barrett's album and and it, that quite whimsical thing that barrett brings to it m turns it into a great album it's 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 flawed it's it's got its bits that i'm not so keen on there's a little bit of sort of um you know they're improvising and thinking they're being all avant-garde naughty and they're not it's a bit um incompetent at that bit but you know it, it's a uh, it's Sid's album um and the thing is it, I, I i i do think that 1967 this lays the groundwork for prog it lays the groundwork for a uh, kraut rock it's it, it is a very important album without a doubt in terms of music history this is probably their most important album. I've got it at number five. Um, it, it defines the psychedelic and aligns it to English whimsy. So if we listen to a bands like Gong or the Canterbury bands, that whimsical idea, which is, which is um, and the Beatles have done it before, but in terms of out and out psychedelia, I think that's where it's nailed, you know, it's on this album. Great album, got that at number five. So at number four, I have Medal. Right, metal is like Atom Heart Mother, but it's up. They're starting to get there. And I think on the, the sidelong echoes, this is the defining track. We've had to go to 1971. We've had to do four albums, you know, uh, um, four years, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six albums till we get to something that resembles a sound. Right, Led Zeppelin did it on the first album. 
Jimi Hendrix did it on the first album. Black Sabbath did it on the first album. What we know is Pink Floyd. Once you take the Sid Barrett stuff out of it, it's all well good. Oh, I, I really love all the weird psychedelic stuff they did beforehand. This stuff's just not very good. It's like Soft Machine. They, they're they just not very good at it. I've upset Soft Machine fans now. Uh, they take a while. Echoes is sublime. Um, I think if I was going to have one track by Pink Floyd, it would be Echoes. Um, if they did if the other side was as good as if side one was as good as side two and echoes was like they're the equivalent of this would be one of the greatest albums ever made but you know um they don't do they um one of these days i'm going to cut you into little pieces with that bass line that's amazing that is incredible to me when i think of pre-dark side of the moon Pink Floyd, it's that track. There's a vibe to that that I absolutely love. Uh, <laughs> Fearless, Saint Tropez, those two tracks, they're just truly awful. You know, it's like um, Richard White fancies himself as a jazz musician. He's not, right? And uh, these sort of cod jazz stylings makes it sound like some, some sort of awful cocktail jazz. Maybe it's a humorous um, aside, but remember, I'm a Frank Zappa fan. That's how you do humour in music. This isn't very funny to me. Um, what else have I put about this one? Um, oh, they've got that track with the dog. They do it on Pink Floyd, you know, Seamus, that track where they got the howling dog. And the only thing about, good thing is about it is the dog. That's a good idea. Stick a dog on it. We'll have him howling throughout this blues. There's a blues, you know, they're not a great blues band. Um, Echoes is the masterpiece. But even with Echoes, the cut down version that you have on Pompeii is much better. And if that, if I was going to have one, when I say that Echoes is the one for me, it would be the Pompeii version. It would not be this album. So I'm, I'm now talking this album down. I really want to do it. I've got it at number four and I was going to put it in the masterpiece. I don't think it's a masterpiece. So we're now at number three. Right, number three, Animals, right? I have always thought that Animals is their great prog moment you know i think conceptually it's possibly the you know what Ro roger waters did to center the band which were like, like we're going to make these albums that got concepts behind them and this one's going to be a sort of a a left-wing take of, of animal farm i'm going to invert the animal farm because i couldn't take the fact that george orwell criticized you know um, marxism on that so he tries to turn it upside down and do an animal farm but against capitalism which is stupid, but um, that's my own p personal political beliefs. But he does it in a brilliant way. The balance between that, but the balance between the politics and the message and all that is well done. And, and I always thought this is their great progressive rock album. So I went back and listened to it again. Um, dogs, that's what's great. Dogs is, dogs is like brilliant. It's, it, it's as good as Echoes. It's, it's one of their great moments. The rest of it isn't quite up there with Dogs. It's not quite there. But this is a really good album. This is verging on Masterpiece, but just isn't quite there for me. And that's my personal choice. Um, but number two, I have Wish You Were Here. Right. Wish You Were Here is a Masterpiece. I'm not a massive fan of it. I put it on again the other day, and I had to grudgingly admit that this never puts a foot wrong it's not my thing but it is so beautiful it is so ethereal it's a rock album it's got bites and what did the bite comes from again is sid barrett it's the it's it's like the spirit or the zeitgeist or the the the, the um uh, um it's the essence that's the word i'm after not zeitgeist the essence of sid barrett emerges and he emerges you know it's it's like he's disappeared and he turns up, fat, shaved head, eyebrows off. He turns up the session expecting to, you know, do the next Pink Floyd album. And, and, and that, it's like a ghost returning from the dead. So although this is like probably the beginnings of dad rock, and it really is, underneath it is that bite. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it is a brilliant album. It's a masterpiece. And for many people, if they said that's their greatest album, it's better than Dark Side of the Moon. I could see that. I didn't know which one to put at number one. Um, for me, personally, um, the first album ever bought by um, Pink Floyd was Dark Side of the Moon. I thought it was great. I was buying Close to the Edge. I'd bought Foxtrot. I'd bought, like, um, uh, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Brain Salad Surgery. And for me, from my perspective, 
it was like as good as any of those albums. It didn't stand out. And then I started to listen to the other Pink Floyd stuff. I got then um, a nice pair. They brought a, a double album out, which I got, and I got rid of it. Uh, I didn't really get the Sid Barrett stuff and sort of full of secrets. I just thought it was rubbish. Uh, and then, then I think I picked up for about two quid relics. This is why I don't have a big, um, uh, you know, uh, fond memories of this early Pink Floyd. Um, I'm a bit of a jazz snob, that's what it is. And when people start to improvise and they can't do it very well, they don't like it. Um, so at number one, of course, I have Dark Side of the Moon. Um, what, did, what did Roger Waters pull off with this? It's just brilliant. What makes it so brilliant? I'll tell you what makes it brilliant. Is that um, if Animals is about, you know, capitalism... If Wish You Were Here is about Sid and mourning a person that still exists but is no longer there artistically or even in, in the personality that you remember, you know, in mourning, mourning someone who's alive. If um, The Wall is about, you know, the perils and pitfalls of being in the biggest band in the world, which I always found a little bit like, oh, just, just shut up. And also with The Wall, when I watched that film, I thought what it tried to do, David Essex with Stardust had done way better. <laughs> um, Dark Side of the Moon is probably the greatest embodiment of existential angst and its relation to death and the infinite. Right, that's a heavy subject. It's almost like the subject. It's the fact that human beings have had to to, to have technology and have wisdom and, and, and like, you know, pot noodles, electric toothbrushes, all the things that we've got that all the other animals haven't got. Um, we've got that. We've had to trade it. And this is the fall of man, isn't it? This is the trade we've made. And the trade is, is that we, we know we're in this universe and we don't understand it. Animals don't even know they're in the universe. They don't know they don't understand it. But we know we don't understand it. And we know that we will die. And that is a thing that we all live with. And to be able to embody that onto a rock album is something else. Right? And uh, to be able to deal, you know, so how do you deal with the afterlife? Is there an afterlife? And to, to boil that down and call, you know, say, well, it's the great gig in the sky, which is like sort of things like a roadie would say, you know, it's like a real rock and roll. You know, when, when I get older and I can't go on the bus anymore and carry gear... You know, when I finally pop my clogs and go to the great gig in the sky, you know, and it's that humour, I, I, I like that. And then to have this sublime angel just whooping across it. And, and I don't think on any of the other albums they ever did anything that was like that. On the run, that sort of electronica, experimental thing. Uh, but it, it, it embodies being on the run. Breathe. You know, um, that that... The, you know, the, the album, this is just a genius album. I really do think it's a genius album. And the final track, um, what the hell's that track called? Can't remember the one that goes, oh, that is a... No, that track, I don't even know if this is the last track. Um, because when I ha had this album, for me, it just moved. It moved sort of from the light. It wasn't that much light, but it just went darker and darker. And it ends up dealing with just the very, very... Um, experience of existence now some people who want to criticize dark side of the moon they want to they want to have a go at money because that's the big song off there that's the you know that's the popular song um and um you know money that cash register the tape loop of that cash register uh, in, in the 70s here in the uk we had a, a, a tv show called are you being served classic tv show Classic TV show, Are You Being Served, was. And I really wish, wish I was talking about that instead of Pink Floyd, but I can't do. But I have managed to wheedle Are You Being Served into the talk about Pink Floyd, which I'm quite chuffed with because you didn't expect that, did you? And the most people that are not from the UK can think, what is he talking about? But the theme to Are You Being Served, um, which, which I think was may have been made around about the same time, maybe even earlier has the same sort of cash register tape loop. But this time, in a much funnier context, it's a greater example 
of the cash register tape loops use. So although I could say money is very important because it's, it's really probably the greatest use of the cash register tape loop in music history, it's not even. It comes second to, <laughs> are you being served? What was his name? Johnny Hazelworth, the composer. That's a proper composer. Man, if only they could have got together later on. You know, he was still alive and they were doing Moment Tune Laps of Reason. Why couldn't they get Hazelhurst in? He would have sorted it out. Com compositional genius there. If I was telling you about him, if we were looking at the theme tune to... Um, um, what's it called? The Frank Spencer. Um, some others do have them. That, he was given the thing to say, don't spend too much money. So he wrote a piece for two piccolos and he based it on the Morse code for Some Mothers Do Have Them. And from that, he created an incredible tune. That's me doing it, you know. What has this got to do with Pink Floyd? What it's got to do with these is that they are not composers like that. Rock bands aren't. Some people have, have members in the rock bands that can compose like Ronnie Hazelwood. I think it was Johnny Hazelwood. It's Ronnie Hazelwood. Hazelworth. Anyway, whatever his name is, that's proper composition. What Pink Floyd are doing is something else and it comes together. It, 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 you know, it does come together like an eclipse which I think might be the name of that track that I couldn't re remember. Maybe it is. Um, but it does come together that everything with Dark Side of the Moon, which is this sort of magic of this band, they're not compositional geniuses, but there's a magic of them together. And they've got there. They wasn't there to start off with, I don't think, but they get there eventually through playing and improvising. And um, within that, the use of sort of music concrete, spoken word, and Roger Waters' vision of being... Um, an intelligent guy that has got what he wanted by 1973 and looks around and questions it all and it embodies and like Jean-Paul Sartre like nausea the, 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 the nausea of existence is embodied on a rock album now that should be an album that sells like 30,000 copies and we're talking about this obscure album but it did it became one of the biggest selling albums in history that's an incredible thing but it's the, it's the sum of its parts and I think the problem with Pink Floyd is um, there's so many bands like Rush, like you know, like Led Zeppelin, like um, you know, all great bands. U2, they're greater than the sum of their parts. That's what makes a great band. Um, Pink Floyd had that, but they didn't know how to utilize it, and most of the time they didn't. But when it came together, it was as good as it gets. And what we have with Wish You Were Here. I think what we have with Dark Side of the Moon and then to some extent Animals and, and we do have it with The Wall even though it's flawed of four albums that when a certain person of a certain age hears them it embodies onto them it like it, 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 it like um, impresses that's the word I want impresses onto them um, a feeling that stays with them it's so strong that it doesn't matter about the other crud Right, and that is the issue that we have with Pink Floyd. Um, by the time they're doing this stuff, the influence of this stuff is not that great. It's more the fact that it's sold a ton of records, right? There's certain bands that copy Pink Floyd. There's a certain type of Pink Floyd sound, and we know it when we hear it. But it doesn't change music. It doesn't come along and then shift it into another gear, right? Which is why I didn't put them in my top ten. They did do it on Piper at the Gates of Dawn. That's the influence they had, along with a few other bands. And they do something very specific on their, that album, and they are there first in some cases. So um, that is my ranking of Pink Floyd. Um, the Pink Floyd fans are going to be up in arms, because unless I said, um, well, I'm going to rank all 15, and they have all joint number one, you know. Uh, maybe I could have a go at Final Cut and Number Gum. Maybe I would have got away from that. But they, they wanted me to... They didn't want me to be bring my objectivity to it. This ranking is different to many of the other rankings. There will be millions of Pink Floyd rankings in that I'm not that much of a fan. 
I have gone and actually listened to these albums and have made a decision myself. And maybe, even if you hate what I've said, even if you think it's a load of rubbish, you're still at the end of this video here, right? You've made it to the end. And maybe that your love of that band has been improved in a way by having my objective opinion, I hope. And you've gone away and thought about it and you maybe thought, Andy's wrong and I might be wrong and you might be right. Or you may at least go, it has made me see it in another way. And, I, and I've got a different idea of the shape of that band, you know, which now in 2024 has ended up with absolute public hate between Roger Waters and Dave Gilmore, both um, existing in two separate spaces, politically, artistically. And um, we know if David Gilmore goes out, we're going to get some beautiful music uh, uh, with some lovely guitar solos and we were all going to be sitting, you know, the, the sort of old yuppie rock thing and wash us over the tickets like 150 quid. That's Dave Gilmore. He represents that bit of Pink Floyd. And then, you know, Roger Waters has literally gone up his own arse where he thinks he can do a, you know, I mean, we've all forgotten about his version of Dark Side. But it was the biggest thing last year, wasn't it? And now that doesn't mean anything. Because it wasn't Roger. He wanted to make the point. He wanted to go say, that was my album. I wrote those songs. That, that was my genius. It wasn't Roger. And that's apparent. If you take out everything else out of that, that was provided by Nick Mason, Richard Wright, and, um, and, and, and Dave Gilmore, once you take that out of Dark Side of the Moon, you're not left with enough for it to mean anything whatsoever. Right. A great band. One of the great bands. But a flawed band. I think that is my final take on Pink Floyd. If you like this video, please put a like on it by pressing the like button. If you press the like button, it will not hurt you. You won't get sold anything. It won't cause any viruses to go on your computer. You know, what might happen is that my next video might appear and that will help my channel. And if you don't like the next video, then just don't watch it and then that's it. But please, if you did like this one, then like it. Because no one ever likes videos and you should because it helps the channel. And since I've been really nagging people to like the channel, I don't know if you've seen, but I've gone up. I, I'm getting bigger views now. So you can do that. And if you want to do, do want to see some more and you want to, you know, join the Andy Edwards Club, then sub subscribe. If you're a Pink Floyd fan, you could subscribe now, right? And then you can go in the comments and say, you're such an idiot, Andy. You do not know what you're talking about you have no right to do these types of videos because you're a fool because you didn't think Pink Floyd are the best band in the world and I'm unsubscribing and then you can tell me that you've unsubscribed when I had like 300 uh, um, subscribers and someone unsubscribed I sort of noticed it go down I don't anymore All right so uh, but I do appreciate you subscribing so on the whole don't need subscribe even if you hate what I've said Right, subscribe because we are friends, you know. We are all friends here. You know, I'm, I'm like your annoying mate that's taking the mickey out of you. That's all it is for being a Pink Floyd fan. That is me. If you knew me in real life, you know that I can't help but do this. I'm playing in bands. I've toured around. You know what being in a band is like? It's four blokes taking the mickey out of each other on a, in a transit van. That is what being in the band is. Right? Um... So, you know, t t don't get all wound up. You know, uh, uh, say I'm wrong. Please say I'm wrong. Say, I don't think you're right about that. You know, I think you're wrong about that track. You don't understand it. You know where, if, if I was going to criticise myself, I would say, Andy, you don't know this catalogue that well, right? Um, the anomalies that you don't like when you're saying it, it doesn't sound like Pink Floyd, that is precisely what makes Pink Floyd great, is they tried all these different avenues, they've gone all down that, and you wouldn't have had Dark Side of the Moon if you hadn't have all that crud that's on, like, Saucer Full of Secrets. You know? And that, that is probably true, right? We're not musos. It's much more about the song, and they've written greater songs than any of those fusion bands that you like. That's all true. I can counter, counter myself if I wanted. I could switch this camera off, switch it back on, and I could go through and argue the opposite. That's called being objective. You are getting my opinion about it anyway. Um, but yeah, don't get all angry. Right? I don't. I like when people push against it. I don't think you're right there, Andy. You know, what about this? You haven't thought. I love all that. But I've got to be honest. Um, as this YouTube gets bigger and having to just read through, oh, I'm a fascist again. Oh, what am I now? Oh my God, I'm a racist. Oh, I'm an idiot, right? 
oh look at this he's swearing at me he's calling me that oh i can't even have that word on the channel it's a swear word he's called me that it's not very nice being called that you know um somebody called me this is like not that offensive but i am it's a little bit offensive so if it's kids watching you know cover their ears some but, but the other day somebody called me an asinine prick that's the sort of insult insults i get i don't think i deserve it <laughs> really and i've got to admit um last week there was a certain one of the evenings i get i got depressed because i was reading how bad a person i was over and over again the whole world's against you they, it's your fault, Andy. You did the YouTube. If you want to get in the public eye, what do you think it's going to be like when you've got 100,000 views? There you are, knocking Adam Neely on these things, taking the mickey out of Rick Beato. What do you think it's like for them? And now you get the other side of it. Now you, you get the, you know, the, 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 the taste of it for the other. You don't like it. You're sitting there going, I don't like it. Well, I don't. I don't. Right, that's it. And I, I, have, I would never go on to another YouTuber and shout at them and swear at them and call them names and say they're these horrible things. Yeah, my sojourn All the ists. I'm all the ists I am. Um, and I thought I could take it, but it's a bit depressing, I must admit. So I just don't think, if someone's going to swear at me, I just, I'm not going to come in and have a go back anymore. That's the new thing. I am going to cut down the amount of comments I answer. I, I'm really probably, of a YouTuber of my size, I'm probably the most engaged with the comments which do my head in so this is the little message you've got you know so if you want to hear from me you're not going to hear me so much but if you do want to hear from me get over to patreon now on patreon has brought a new thing out right patreon's got this new thing where i can create posts for just the free members so you can register for patreon but just because you're not paying anything and once a month i'm going to do a post out so you will get to see stuff and there will be a thing so i i've put an unpublished video for the free members up to date of me jamming with robert plant on a beatles song no one's ever seen anything like that right and i'll also let you know what's going on, on the main channel the big thing that's happened is we've set up a whatsapp group and it is just a lively thing. My Patreon has become a thing that is like day to day. We live in it. It's a really important thing. And if you love music, it's well worth coming over to Patreon. And the more that you come over, the more I can do. And the thing is, is that if Patreon gets to a certain size, I tell you, this channel, if it's making, if, you, if that's where it is at, that's where the money is at, and that's where the reward is at, this will slowly go. Right? Um, so, uh, but it won't. As long as I'm supported, you know. Um, I really do want to grow this into something great, this channel, and I really want to do it because I want to save this music that we love, and I want to be have a have a place where I can um, really bring to the fore new artists. Um, I'm 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 a one of the things I'd like to do is at the end of every video you get a video of a modern prog band or fusion band, so that you know you can stay at the end. I'm, we're not related to. Thanks for watching. It's the end of the video now. That's done. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.